gave uh, I gave Peter a little introduction um, before, but again to to uh, reiterate, founding member of the guild, a wood artist in his own right, um, major contributor to the guild with uh, recording um, DVDs and and recording at the seminars and. Um, it's just done an amazing amount of work with the guild. And uh, for those of us who have seen his work, um, you can see it in New London quite a bit, right, Peter? It's all over in New London. Two restaurants. Yeah, two restaurants. Gorgeous stuff. At any rate, without further ado, I'll introduce Peter Block. He'll show us how he does his magic. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, I just have to warn you up front i haven't demonstrated i used to demonstrate all the time i haven't demonstrated now for two and a half years the last time i did was at the big symposium at pinkerton which is coming up again in may hopefully you're all going to go to that uh, so i feel a little rusty about wood turning not wood turning demonstrating for those of you who aren't wearing glasses or near the front row i'm going to give you some very stylish glasses because I do make a lot of shavings. It's a pretty messy operation. Uh, oh, another little pre, oh, some of you weren't here, just the bathrooms inside. You will find that if you wander around, there's some signs and feel free to look around the house. And I'm gonna shamelessly promote my wife's Christmas concert, which is tomorrow afternoon in New London. Kathy Lowe, many of you have heard her sing. Uh, so I am going to refer to my notes a lot more than I would normally because I feel so rusty about all this. Um, you know, I, I demonstrate for people and very few people actually ever make a lampshade. So the point, so what's the point of coming to a demonstration that I do if you're not going to make a lampshade? Partly it's entertaining to see sort of extreme wood turning. Uh, but my hope is that there's some skills and some techniques and tools that I'm using that are also useful for other things. So those are thin, you know, I do very thin end grain turnings. Uh, whether they're spindle turnings or not, John probably would disagree, but they are spin, uh, spindle orientation done with mostly bowl turning tools. Um, and I'm dealing with heavy pieces. Uh, just to, well, I'll point it out but before I forget. This is a winch system that allows me to lift some of the heavy logs. Actually, Dave, David's neighbor, Kevin Plunkett, helped me design all that. Uh, yeah, so uh, for years, my, Kathy would come in here every time I lifted a piece and we'd grunt and lift these heavy pieces up there. Uh, now I try not to do that kind of lifting, although smaller pieces like this one I can lift without without the system. And then there's other things about what I'm doing that are more about the approach to wood turning. That um, we're working with thin turnings it requires patience, requires or drink caffeine in the morning. I want to be real in that zone. Right about, uh, this came, the lamp, five years of experimenting. And they were, it wasn't with the point of coming up with a, a new part of my woodworking career. It was really just out of an interest, uh, curiosity about translucent wood. And, you know, Johannes's hats, you know, you've all seen Johannes Mickelson's hats are, are kind of from that kind of thing. A lot of the most interesting things you see in woodworking and wood turning and arts and crafts generally are from people that didn't set out to make a thing. They just sort of pursued something that seemed curious. Um, and you'll see some things that I'm working on here to help reduce vibration. Uh, vibration is sort of the bugaboo for wood turners. And when you're working with big pieces of wood, they can be uh, more, more difficult. Things can come up about vibration. And you'll see some different tools that some, a lot of what I do are just basic wood turning gouges, but there's some different tools. 
little background. I've been a full-time woodworker for 35, 36 years. I've been a juried member of the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen that long, and I started wood turning just a couple years after I started doing woodworking. The lampshades I've been selling for 25 years now, plus the five years of experimenting before that. So there's a lot of, a lot of my life has been spent doing this one thing, and now it's 100% of what I do with woodworking is lampshades. I don't do any of the other many. I used to do hundreds of various kinds of accessory things, some of which you'll see in my showroom if you go in there. But now it's 100% wood turning. Plus, I've developed a, a new career as a as a new a second like I needed a second second creative endeavor. But I also do drone photography and videography. And that's half of half the work I do now. So I am cutting back on the wood turning, but I'm not retired, as several of you have asked or pointed out that I am retired. I am not retired. Um, uh, yeah. There you go. Same here. But John doesn't have to do much sanding. I've seen a lot of his work straight off the tool. <laughs> um, the, the other thing that's changed about my work over the last 10 years is I used to do almost, in, mo almost everything I did was table lamps and floor lamps. Now, probably 70 or 80% of the work I do are installation projects, chandeliers, sconces, a lot of collaborations with a blacksmith. And you can see photos around of some things. You'll see one of the blacksmiths pieces on the table over there. All of those finished shades that are over there are for chandeliers. Um, and that's been a really interesting change in my work. Uh, a little bit more, actually, like John, you do, I would say, architectural, a lot of architectural work and, and working on at that scale and with uh, pieces that are going to be installed permanently in a home and be the centerpiece like that. Um, equipment, I tr I'll try not to talk too long, I'll try to get to making, making shavings, but uh, the equipment that I feel is necessary to make lampshades are a heavy duty lathe. You cannot make this on a mini lathe, you can't make it on even a midi lathe. You really need something substantial because of the weight of the, of the wood. And this looks like about a 200 year old machine, but it's about 20, it's a one way and a 22 years old. Uh, and you, you'll need, I'll show this in a moment, but you'll need some kind of a heavy duty spur center. This is something John, do you, you don't make, or you do still make these. These are really cool spur centers. For a sale today, good Christmas present for yourself. Uh, heavy duty faceplate. Uh, I did the first lampshades on regular flat face plates, but now I do them all on these one-way face plates, which are much thicker and have these really heavy rims. It reduced half of the vibration issues I was having. It's hard to believe that a quarter-inch thick steel plate, flat steel plate, would have would be a, a source of vibration, but it certainly is. Uh, and the one that I'll be working on later is a larger version of the same. Same kind of faceplate. Um, you'll see me use tools. They're called Stewart system tools. Unfortunately, Dennis Stewart doesn't make them anymore. I don't even know if he's still alive. Uh, but some equivalent to the tool tools I use on the inside would be really handy. Flexible lights, lights that you can. These in the inside. A fast sharpening system. I use John Siegel's system, which if you go to his demo, you gave it to me. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> it's John's system. <laughs> um, because I, I sharpen all the time and working with thin turnings, it's really important that the tools be super sharp and any system that is slow to use is going to be something either that takes too much time or I'm going to not sharpen when I need to sharpen just because it's sort of a pain in the neck. Um, and compressed air. I use a lot of compressed air for various aspects of this. Without it, 
It's really awkward. Um, and the last thing before I start actually turning is that the wood that I use is, I use, which is what we call poplar or poplar in New England. Um, and I use it, so just to explain about the poplar word, John's piece that is being passed around, tulip poplar has nothing to do with what grows here in New England, completely unrelated species. But it's a very common species, tulip poplar. It's in lumber yards, and it's I think, the third most common hardwood lumber in this country. What I use is aspen, same thing that's grown in Colorado. It's actually the most common hardwood in the world, most of which grows little weed trees. But right here in central New Hampshire and Vermont, there are really big aspen trees, bigger, I believe, than any other part of the world. So I happen to live in the right place to do this. Actually, when you go outside, there's a pretty big aspen tree right behind this wall here. Um, so I spent, during those five years of experimenting, I did try lots of, I tried everything but aspen, basically. Uh, aspen is a wood that, it's considered a junk species from a forestry point of view. Woodworkers don't tend to use it. So even though it was growing all around here, I just never thought to try that. Uh, and it was a demo demonstration like this where I was just demonstrating bowl turning uh, where I cut an aspen tree down. I didn't want to cut down a really nice tree. I just wanted to get rid of an aspen tree out in the yard. And it was, I was making a bowl form. It was an inch thick. I happened to swing a light around behind the outside of the bowl and I could see a little translucency coming through the wood. That would five years. Experimenting. In that one moment, I knew that it would be possible to make really good, functional, attractive lampshades. Up to then, I hadn't. All my experiments had just ended up in the junk pile. Which is so dark that you'd hardly know if they were on or off. Maybe in a room with no lighting at all, you could see a little red glow coming through. Whereas the aspen is just completely different. But even then, it was a few years before I realized how big a deal this was in my own life. Uh, you know, the first year that I was making lampshades, I probably just made three or four. Gradually, you know, built up to that. And now that it's all that I do, well, this year is different now that I've got an, another profession doing the, the drone work. But uh, when I, up to this point, I've been making somewhere around 70 to 95 lampshades a year and that's it's, it's time comes for me that's all I can make in a year um, but you do it for long enough and you make a lot of lampshades so I number them all and I'm up to 1850 lampshades well I, the way I answer the question because it, it's so many different pieces you know it's not done straight through A to Z but I when I was doing it all the time I knew how many I could make in a year so I did the division. It's basically three days to make a table lamp. Two and a half, three days. Now that's all the parts. The lamp base, there's a wood plate, there's a wooden finial, but most of it, of course, is the shade. So with a bigger piece, I would normally do this with the, uh, the winch system. But with smaller ones, get that in the middle. Yeah. yeah. The annual rings that are about six inch diameter at this end. The large end is centered on the on the bark essentially. And I do that, now if the, the pith was right up the center of the tree, it wouldn't, they'd be the same thing. But most trees, the pith is off center. By doing what I just described, you end up getting the annual rings across the shade more or less horizontal. Now, the trees aren't exactly round, so the, the annual rings will sweep up and down. But if you look at that shade that's lit over there, you'll see the annual rings are the horizontal lines, and they're pretty close right across. Uh, if you a different way, you'd end up getting annual rings slope up and down or as you go around the shade. 
they tend to not look round. They are round, but it's an optical illusion that the annual rings will create with that, those up and down lines that makes it look a little out of round. Uh. Oh, good. Uh, let's see. This will work. I can get. Yeah, yeah feel, feel free, free to, to ask, ask questions. questions. As I go. No, it's pretty closed grain. It's uh, it has the reputation for being very soft. I, I would say it's about the same hardness as white birch. Certainly harder than pine or something like that. But as hardwoods go, it's a relatively soft one. When when I've done it for lampshades, it doesn't really. It's not easier to work with or harder to work with than other types of wood. It's just I use it for the result of the translucency. Uh, but if a wood was hard, I'm always working with wet wood, so there, it's relatively easy to carve away the wood. So I use, and, and this is sort of a basic technique thing, I, I use the gouge in two ways. The So this drag, this what I call a drag cut, is basically just using a gouge as a scraper. Uh, you can see it's tearing up the surface terribly. I have one. I don't like it very much for it. Um, no, I don't. I find the shallow bevel, the shallow uh, flute, not very effective, whereas the bowl gouge has a much deeper flute. I think it's, I, I don't know that really technically what's going on, but I, I used to use that one because it seemed like the smart thing to do. Once I got this bowl version of the same kind of size. Yes, so this is a conical grind. When I sharpen, maybe I'll talk more about the grind. I don't use the Ellsworth. Irish type grind, uh, and that's partly because I want I want a, a way to sharpen that is really fast, and I don't. I've never really felt that the Irish grind sweat pack wings were that was that useful for what I'm doing. If I was doing regular side grain bowls, I probably would pay more attention to that. So if I was, the way, what I'm gonna do in the demonstration is just do a little bit of work on this rough cutting. 
then I'm going to jump way ahead to the other piece I've got ready here, which is there's going to be a whole long gap that's missing in the process because you don't want to stay here for two days, right? Um, but I think it's interesting to just sort of see, you know, the bark was on the outside. Well, there are actually a couple of them over near the door that are the whole log. What I didn't describe is that I used a chainsaw to cut corners off of it to make it sort of an octagonal cone. Uh, it saves a little bit of time at this stage, but the main reason I do that is to get an early glimpse. Can you hear me okay when I'm turned away? It gives me an early glimpse of what's inside the log. For example, this one. Slow down. Has some big insect tunnels, right? You probably can't see them there, but there's some. They're little. They're ant tunnels, and there there's two types of ants that get into these, this type of wood. One is little teeny ants make beautiful little perforations. I love seeing that. The big ones I'm less fond of. They're harder to fill if I want to fill them. So in this case, I saw some of these big holes, and I actually cut off a few inches on the end. There's other times when I'll use a chainsaw and I'll see right away that it's just got a defect that I don't want to work with a big knot or something. So that's the main reason I'm chainsawing off the side, the side, the corners of the log, just to get some knowledge of what's in the wood before I bother to bring it into the shop. So the, the, so the drag cut is the way of getting rid of wood quickly, but it's going to leave that really torn surface. So the appropriate way of using the gouge is a real cutting motion where I'm pushing the tool entirely on that line. The bevel is in contact with the wood. This, you know, I think I'm sure there's a, a wide mix of experience and skill levels here. So some things are going to be a lot. I'm going to try not to be spending a lot of time talking about the, the basics. But if I stop this, I think I can. You know, you can see the quality of that cut, and this is still working with a roughing gouge, is so different than this cut. So. What I would do at this, if I was really making this lampshade right now for myself, is I would get this trued up, smoothed up. I'd get this surface. Actually, I'll just do one or two cuts on this end grain. I would get the two ends of it kind of perpendicular to the axis of the, the lathe. So I would do that on this end. On this end, I would get it just very slightly concave and the diameter, like a quarter inch more than the diameter of the faceplate I'm going to use. That makes it much easier later on when I'm going to set the faceplate on there and screw it on if the diameter here gives me a kind of a guide to work with. Get this out of the way. This was cut a year ago. It was delivered to me last fall. So it's still soaking wet. They get aged. You can see, you know, you can see these color streaks in here. And that comes from funguses. It's spalting, funguses getting in the wood. Um, a small log like this, this is really close to the end of how long I can age it. But I'm, I'm trying to be at a point where it is aged and colorful, but not decayed yet. Most, in fact, over, I heard some far end saying spalting is, is rotting. I suppose, I would say spalting, good spalting is before, is the, the pre-stage before you get to rotting. 
The funguses have gotten in there and colorized the wood, but they haven't started the decay, or the decay process hasn't progressed to the point where the wood has lost its integrity. They're just out there in stacks in the yard. I've experimented with doing things like turning something kind of to this stage, put it in a pile of kind of semi-rotten shavings and sort of encouraged it. it. It works a little bit, but you tend to get just spalting on the wide rim of the shade. It doesn't get into the inside enough. So this piece, when I put it on the lathe originally, probably weighed in the neighborhood of 150 pounds. At this point, I think it's down to like 30 maybe. So it's pretty manageable, but I did use the winch, of course, to get it up on there. I'm usually trying to get the biggest shade that I can out of the log, but uh, not always. Uh, this one was actually a little bit bigger. This one I'm gonna make into a pair of sconces. And I have a bunch of large sconces and I have, a, uh, there's a pair I'm working on, I think right, right to, to right to David, that's a pair of small sconces. But I'm missing in my inventory right now anything that's sort of medium size. So I did purposely trim away some extra wood. Uh, but usually I'm maximizing what I can get for diameter. So what I've done on this is taken it past that stage to get it trued up, put the faceplate on it. I'm using usually nine long screws, but they're not, they're not crazy long. They're also fairly large diameter screws. They kind of fit the holes in the faceplate. Uh, I'm trying to reduce any chance of shifting of the wood versus the faceplate. And I've done this, every lampshade I've ever made is this system of usually nine screws into the wood. And I've never had a, a piece Uh, Clay was demonstrating, he was doing this kind of thing. He had long, tall vessels. I think they were like five feet long. And he did the same kind of thing with screws, but he also drilled dowel. He drilled holes in sideways on the wood, put in half inch or three quarter inch dowels this direction, and then the screw would intersect those dowels. Um, whether he needed to, I don't know, but it would be a more secure way of doing it. So I put the faceplate on it, and I then trued it up again and got the beginning of an outside shape that I was planning to make. When I'm doing commission work for people, you know, often like over there are three, uh, there's a pair and there's a, a, a set of three shades that are gonna go on these long, uh, I don't have a diagram, but anyway. And those are pretty close to identical. So I'm not improvising in that case. First of all, the client has picked out the shape and size and so I'm working really hard to try to get three that are the same. In this case, I'm improvising the shape and I, that's a more interesting way of wood turning. It uh, doesn't have the problems that John has of <laughs> having to make extra ones. Let's see, I don't need that. So when it's, I'll grab. Um, when I put it on the faceplate, I'm trying to get it as centered as possible, but it's always off by a little bit. So I have, you can see a little bit of a, a wobble right there. This, I got this faceplate on almost exactly. Sometimes it's shifted by a quarter of an inch. 
Um, but what I'll do now, I'm going to use the same kind of good technique push cut to hopefully work down to the final shape and surface. My eyes are not on the tool, they're on the, on the upper profile. That's a hard thing for beginners to do. It's hard to, you just want to look at the tool tip. It seems like what's important. And I am looking at the tool tip right there at the entry point. But then my eyes are shifting up to the top where I can see the shape. And an important thing about ergonomics, which would apply I, to almost any wood turning, and I, that, therefore I assume most of you know it, whenever you can attach the tool to your body, you're going to get a much smoother cut. So if, if you're holding your tool away from you, I mean, sometimes you have to. Sometimes the position you're in just requires you to be like that. But to whatever extent you can attach the, the butt end of the tool into your hip or your side, you're going to get more control because you're adding the weight of your body to it. And the, the more subtle version of that is I'm trying not to use my right hand to push the tool. I'm actually using my right hand to pull the tool into my hip, and I'm pushing the tool with my hip. That really turning, and I notice a little bit of vibration setting up. That's the first thing I think about is what, what's going on with this hand? Am I pulling or pushing? It's very instinctive to push with your right hand, but I think you get what I'm saying. Um, the left hand is doing very little. It's, it, it's there as a safety in case something were to catch, it wouldn't come up. Although that doesn't, I'm probably because I'm experienced, that doesn't happen to me. And it's helping to reduce vibration. But what I'm never doing is using my left hand to push it into the wood. As soon as you do that, especially with side grain, where the consistency of the wood is going to vary as you go around the piece, uh, you'll start to get vibration. So I, I would highly suggest trying to keep your left hand doing a very minimal amount of what's happening here. So that surface is quite good. I feel a little, when I feel it, I can feel a little bit of a high area right there, but it's, it's not extreme. Uh, and then on the grain, this part right here, I'll switch to a narrower, longer nose version of the gouge. It seems to cut across this end grain a little better. Well, here's, here's an interesting little tip. You see these little bits of tape on my wall? There's this, well, you can't see them. There's a row of them over there. When I'm making match sets of shades, I use those as a aiming points for my tool. So if I always want this, this rim and the next rim to be the same angle, if I aim, like I often am aiming at that worn out blue cross on the wall there. Uh, so I'll do that right now. If you're using the same tool and you're aiming it at the same spot on the wall, you'll get the exact same line here. And if I was doing, sometimes I'm aiming at different things when I'm coming this way. On the inside, there's various ways that I'm aiming it. Of course, this won't work if you're using different gouges with different angles on them, but uh, there, so there you learn something. Um, so this is, this is as much as I would have done with, uh, until about 10 years ago, I would work with fine gouge, I'd go work with a little smaller gouge than that, and I'd be done with the outside and it'd be ready to sand. I realized a few years ago I could use the tool that I use, you'll see me use it a lot more on the inside for thinning, I could use that on the outside too. 
So this is the Stuart system tool. I think Sorby still makes, Sorby, Sorby stole the Stuart system design for this. It's called a hooker. And uh, it's designed for hollow vessels, for going in through the hole in the top of a hollow vessel and bending it around to get into the upper inside shoulder. I used to do a lot of hollow vessels. Before I, before I did lampshades, you can see some of my pieces from 30 years ago on those postcards. And that's how I got, I learned how to use this tool. Sorry, it's gonna be in somebody's way, but. So I'm gonna use this at about a 45 degree angle. So I'm tipping the tool tip over. So it's a uh, sheer scrape. And I'm using the long edge of the tool. When I'm doing the inside, you'll see me do a lot, some other different things with these tools. And actually, I usually set up. I usually set this light up so it's shedding right along the surface, and I can see there's like a like the surface of an old phono, phonograph record, LP record, you know, little thin grooves from the leading edge of the gouge. Uh, so I can see those. I can also see a little bit bigger bump there, you know, like a hundredth of an inch rather than a thousandth of an inch, I guess. So I can just lightly graze this along the surface. What it means is I'm going to do less sanding later because I won't have those little micro grooves to take out. So this saves me a lot of sanding. I start sanding with 150 grit sandpaper. Um, and I actually could a lot of times start with 220 grit. So that's a pretty smooth surface. You know, I, I don't, you know, probably, if you felt like you had really good control over it, you know, a, a flat scraper, you know, one that was rectangular, it would mean you're tipping it up on its edge, and if it's catching near the upper end of the scraper, it's gonna have a tendency to vibrate on you, it's trying to tip over, whereas, the round, the round stock here and the control of the arm brace allows you to have so much control that it doesn't feel like it's tipping, tw tweaking around. Whether it need, I don't think it actually needs to have the gooseneck. It just happens to be the way my tools are designed. If any of you try it out, and I'd like to know that because I've demonstrated for years and everyone speculates about it, I don't really know whether this is helping me in any fashion. Um, One thing that's true about me is I've been turning kind of the same way for 30 years, and there are new fancy ways to turn. I was thinking about it yesterday. My Gordon Keeler, he's passed away, but he lived just a few houses down here. He was a big part of the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen for, he was, had a booth at the craft fair for 56 years. And he was my mentor when I first started doing this. And after I learned to do modern wood turning as of 30 years ago, I would watch him wood turn. I think that is like so old fashioned. There's so many better ways to do it. I'm probably in that situation now where, but everything I do works for me very well. And I don't really feel inclined to be the old dog that does learn a new trick. Um, one thing I didn't explain is that I don't do the whole outer shape at first. I usually divide it into three sections. So there'll be two shorter sections that I'll continue this shape to get the final. This is going to be kind of a bell shape, upside down bell shape as a sconce on the wall. But I want this big massive wood here to help stabilize and reduce vibration. If I got it down to six inches in diameter here, there'd be much more tendency for this part to start to just vibrate a little bit. 
Uh, okay. So working on the inside, I, the part I've done already, I did some of it with a gouge, like just sort of digging in with a gouge. The way, the way you would do a bowl, more or less, but always keep in mind the grain is going this direction. So if, like you saw me working this direction on the outside, if it was a bowl, you'd be trying to work this way to be cutting off the ends of the grain. And the same thing as we're going through the inside parts, the same things start to happen on the inside. I'm going the opposite direction than a typical bowl turner would. Uh, so I used a gouge to go in maybe three inches in here. Then I switched to my uh, other arm brace tool. So this is the same, kind, the same arm brace handle. Actually, John made me this nice heavy-duty shaft. The shaft that normally comes with it is about that long and thinner. And on the, actually, I'll pass around a couple of these. The tip I'm using here, I call it a spear point. It's quarter inch square and it's ground to be a, a very narrow cutting tip. And it's also relieved on the bottom and the sides so that there's very little resistance. If I want to jab it straight into the wood, which you'll see me do, if it had a wide tip on it, it would, ha it would have more resistance pushing it into the end grain. Because I am going to use this straight into the grain of the wood and that's a, there's a lot of resistance to that. But that, that narrow tip with the grind, the way it's ground away, it's actually fairly easy to push it into wet wood. So I'm doing a couple of things. I'm, I'm jabbing it straight into the end grain, and then as much as possible, I'm trying to sweep sideways. That's a, at least a little less resistance than straight into the grain. Yeah, so the cones you see here are from this, set, this step, and the cone is going to come out of here in a minute. The cone is not much of a time saver, a little bit like the chainsawing thing outside. It saves a little bit of time, but the main thing it allows me to keep the tailstock touching this for as long as possible while I'm doing the rough cutting. But pretty soon it's in the way. So that's at the stage I'm at now is to try to dig away wood and take the cone out. Oh yeah, if you could grind away the tip of a, but those are carbide, they'd be hard to manipulate, wouldn't they? Yeah. Well, that's interesting whether the, I've never used those tools, um, but the, nat, the, the pointier that little end is, the easier it'll slide into the wood, and then you can use sort of the shoulders on either side of the tip to widen like the McDoughton did, does. You hear that sound right there? That's a knot. That's something that, well, you've all worked with wet wood and whole logs, and you know that you never know what's inside there. So at this point, I'm extended that far over the tool rest with this tool and not feeling any sense that this is, I'm going to lose control of it. These arm braces are really a great way to hold on to and get big overhangs. I, I can hang it, I, I can go about that far back in there, that much overhang without. The further I go though, the more you'll hear that kind of vibration. The spear point tool is very effective for roughing away the wood. It is, it's a little bit like that drag cut on the outside. It's not going to leave any kind of a even halfway nice surface. It's just hacking away the wood quickly. 
but I'm always doing this when I'm a, about an inch away from the, uh, the final surface. Now, for those of you who have used the McNaughton tool or the other, there's another tool like that, right? One way makes one that's like that. Um, you could get down to like an inch and a half diameter point down here to map it out because the grain is going across the end of the cone. Here, I have to get a lot smaller because the grain's going this way, so it's much stronger, more resistant to the cone snapping out. So I'm usually getting it down to less than a half an inch down here. Like that. The cone-shaped ones are the centers. The ones that are stacked up are the part down here where the faceplate's attached. You know, they have the pith in the middle of them, so most of the cones eventually crack. And they're not, you know, you could experiment with making little mini lampshades out of them, but aspen is so plentiful it's not like you're using rosewood and have to try to maximize every little bit of it. Oh, we've done a lot of things with them. We've, uh, sometimes I put them back on the lathe on a screw center and uh, clean them up. And then just as art workshops with friends, we will paint them, use markers on them. I used to bring them all to the New London, New London Elementary School where they had a Native American Indian project they did with fourth graders. And the kids would all paint one of them and then they'd stack them up to make totem poles. Now the curriculum requirements are so stringent that they don't really have time to mess around with fun things. So the work I'm gonna be doing now is gonna be on the inside. And I would encourage you to take turns trying to come over to this side, because you will not see it very well from this side. Maybe you'll see it in the screen a little bit. Um, how much are we using the tripod right now? What if we move the tripod out of the way? That would provide some room for people to come over into this area. You'll just have to take turns a little bit, I think, but or watch the movie later. Uh, I guess, I, so I'm gonna talk about sharpening. Uh, so John Siegel's system is brilliant, unconventional, and it's all based on a, uh, this is just an inexpensive um, four, by, four by 36 belt sander, right? If you're using uh, high, a lot of fancy metal, these are pretty, pretty high-tech gouges, you may want to get a zirconium oxide belt, but if you're using regular, John, is that right, regular high-speed steel, you can do it with aluminum oxide belts, which is what you do, I think. Uh, yeah. So my entire sharpening process takes this long. And usually that's set up right where Peter's sitting, so it's just right there. I can quickly get this right to super sharp. No, it's a, a, a hard felt wheel that I've gouged out to make something that I can turn the gouge upside down and do the outside. I've also purposely dulled the left side of the belt. I just use my teardrop stone to dull the left side of the belt, so 
I'm grinding over here and almost buffing or uh, buffing is not quite the right word, but polish. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, so at this point, the light switches are behind you, David. Could you turn off all the lights? This was that eureka moment. Let's see. So that's a little over an inch thick right now. I'll stand here and I'll tell you the answer to this. There's just almost nothing, but there's a little bit of hint of translucency already coming through. Any other species of wood, you'd have to get it down to about three-eighths of an inch before you'd see anything at all. So now it's probably five eighths or three quarters of an inch thick. And at least anybody that's on that side can see a little bit of light coming through. Uh, I am, and uh, when I get it a little thinner, I can explain it more, but if I don't, remind me to come back to that. Um, I do, I leave the rim, again, we'll see that more when I get down to the final cuts, but. I leave the rim thicker on almost all my shades. It's not to stabilize, not to reduce flexibility or anything. It's actually to purposely create a darker band. At the, so if you look at the shade over there, it's a little darker at the top and bottom. The bottom actually isn't as dark as usual on that one. Um, it creates a framing effect that emphasizes the translucency, especially when they're against a light colored wall. If I made this, thin all the way to the rim, it, it's the same translucency, but it's not, it's again, a sort of an optical illusion issue there where the, the dark, it's a frame and it brings your eye into the translucent area and it makes it feel like it's brighter. Because there's always gonna be a dark rim at the top on a regular, like a table lamp shade. It's gonna be a dark rim at the top where the shade ring is holding it up. So, remembering where the grain direction is going, the grain's this way, so I can do a little work off the end this direction. It's actually a mirror image of the cut I was doing on the, on the, on the rim over on, from that side. And that gets me, so now I'm at about a half an inch, half an inch rim out at the outer part. And, The cut I'm doing right at this moment is that drag cut. I'm not really following the bevel at all, but now, now I'm pushing the tool. I should have a little diagram to show what's happening, but if that's the grain of the wood, I'm sort of always trying to figure out which way to go so I'm not cutting up into the grain. Um, and it, a diagram would have helped to explain what I mean by that. So I use the drag cut just to get down to the point where I have, you know, like a half an inch left. Again, that drag cut is not leaving a very smooth surface. Yeah, that's at least, that's a half an inch or more. Actually, I'll get my double-ended calipers. So I don't use these in my regular work, except when I'm doing match sets, but they're very handy when I'm demonstrating. Can you see the gap in the jaws there? So that's the thickness that I'm at. It's a half an inch or at least. 
And there's already a fair amount of light coming through. What the objective is, is to get down to about a tenth of an inch. Actually, This is a section from a whole shade. So of course this was the whole round shade and I've cut it into a section like I do with my sconces. And yeah. So can you see that well enough? The thinness also allows the wood to be very flexible, which is good from a durability point of view. They're, these shades are rugged as can be. It does mean that vibration, if any vibration sets up, it can be pretty severe with this amount of flexibility. Uh, and yeah. How I'm going to get to that thickness is not by using those double-ended calipers. It's going to be entirely by using the light to help me gauge the thickness. Um, and I've done this so much that I'm very used to the colors that I'm seeing. So I'll, I'll know a lot about how thick the wood is simply by what I'm seeing visually. So cutting, trying to always cut down grain is where the gouge has a limitation. I can cut on this rim, I can cut this direction right at the rim on the inside, and I'll be cutting down grain until I get to the point where the bevel is parallel to the bed of the lathe. If I kept trying to push this around like that, I'd be climbing up into the grain. So. I don't want to do that because I'll get tear outs and I'm so th tear outs are a big problem when you're down to a tenth of an inch you can't have tear outs in the surface. So I will use this gouge and I'll use an even smaller version of this gouge to do this rim. I'm going to use a different tool to cut, to, you just can't get the gouge in there to cut the direction you want to cut. If this was a bowl you'd be very happy turning, cutting this direction all the time. But it's a little bit like the problem you have with a bowl that's curved in at the top. Like you, you don't really want to cut this, the direction which I'm very happy cutting this rim right now. If the grain was going this way, you'd end up with tear outs right there. Am I saying that in a way that's making any sense? Okay. Um, don't hesitate to stop me. David, you're very good at this. Thank you. Um, so the thinnest part is probably three-eighths of an inch right now. I'm going to get it a little thinner there first. What I'm looking for is something that's more like a yellow color. Um, Double-ended calipers. I'm guessing this is probably a quarter of an inch thick right now, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, that's about a quarter of an inch. Can you see that gap there? So I want to get it down to under half of that thickness. But before I do, I'm going to switch to another tool. It's, the same, it's that Stewart system tool that I use on the outside for smoothing it. No, I sharpen it on the edge. Yeah. Um, so when I used it before, I was using this long edge, the long sort of straightish edge to do this surface here. And I will do that on the inside, but before I get to that point, I'm turning this tip. So I'm now going to cut on the kind of the fingernail shaped part of the tool. The narrower the tool is, the more aggressively it'll cut. And the wider the tool is, the smoother the cut. It's actually the opposite 
of the way you would use a bowl gouge, for example, where you do roughing with wide and you'd get smaller and smaller to do finish cuts. Um, John, explain to them why that is. I don't know why it is, it just is. So, oh, always important, if you are using one of these hooker tools, you have to get the tool rest back behind the curve. If you have the tool rest here, it will want to torque over. So, always remember that. Again, I'm, I've got it at about a 45 degree angle of the, of the edge to the surface of the wood. And I'm and what I this this is sort of between the long edge and the spear point. It's cutting. Try this. So, I don't want to do this too much because that light on my right is distracting to me, but if, I think you'll be able to see as I'm making these cuts, the light changing. Does that help? And a big way that I can tell how thin they are, it will, the, the main way is color. The more yellow it is, the thinner it is. But the other way I can tell how thin they are is if I have a sense that I'm taking a light cut, you know, uh, a 64th of an inch thick cut, and the, the color doesn't change very much as I make that cut, that tells me it's thick. If I'm taking off a 64th of an inch from three quarter inch thick wood, as a percentage, I haven't changed it very much. So the light, the color of the light won't change very much. If it's a quarter of an inch and I take off a 64th, I've removed uh, 25%. Is that right? No, maybe less than that. An eight. Yeah. So the thinner it is, the more change I'll get from very light cuts. And that's actually pretty important to how I'm doing this. I don't think about it consciously, but I'm just aware that the color's changing quickly. That tells me I'm close to a final thickness. So I'm taking another bowl gouge now. It's my smallest diameter bowl gouge. And I'm gonna use that to do the last cuts on both the sort of outer part of the rim and the inner part of the rim. Okay, yeah, thank you. I guess I can leave this on, I don't think it's too distracting. So I'm gonna take off a little bit more on the part that's sort of facing out towards you. You can hear some different sounds now that are coming from the fact that it's thin enough that it's starting to act like a drum. So those vibrations will, they're, they're not the kind of vibrations that wreck the surface, but they do start to make some different sounds. Now I'm using the gouge on the, on the inside of the rim. Again, I've tried to keep the heel of the tool attached to my body. That will help me get a smooth curve on the inside. If it's detached from my body, I might get little jiggles and little ridges on that inner surface. Again, that makes it harder to sand.
And I, I often put my fingers on the outside to help reduce that vibration. Okay, so that's getting there. I'm gonna to go to a, maybe half of that thickness. Can you see the gap? Does that show from where you're sitting? David was talking about failures and diet salad bowls. And when I was learning to be a wood turner, I had five years of doing lots of pretty disastrous things to innocent pieces of wood. But in 1800 lampshades, I've never gone through the side of one. I've never broken one. Um, and it's really in large part because you can see the thickness as you're working. That's so different than what well, with the salad bowl problem of making it too thin in the bottom. You know, there's gadgets you can use. You have to stop the lathe and try to use the gadget to figure out how thick that is. But it's so easy to to get into a problem. And you know, you've if, for those of you, I guess Johannes has demonstrated for your group. So you know, he's using the same idea of using a light generally on the inside. He has that light bulb system get the light bulb on the inside. Uh, I think it would be impossible, impossible to make a good lampshade if you weren't using light like this. Because you just cannot, if you use double-ended calipers, I actually had an electronic gadget for a while that was measuring thickness, it was used as designed to measure paint thicknesses on surfaces. But you, know, you have to stop the lathe to do it. And double-ended calipers aren't accurate enough. A, a variation of a thousandth of an inch will show up as dark, darker or lighter. So I, relying on the light coming through is so much more reliable to get even translucency. And when I see, and there are a few people uh, in the guild, and I've demonstrated for the AW symposiums, and there's a few people around the country who have Oh, where'd I put my uh, nut driver? Oh, there. Um, so there are a few other people who have made lampshades based on what I'm doing. Um, the thing I notice right away is that they have bands of different brightness across the shade. I'm really fussy about that situation, so I'm... I, I wouldn't ever show anybody a lampshade that had some kind of a, a band across it that was darker or lighter. Uh, yeah, again, thanks. So I've, oh, I, uh, I'll get you to do it again. Sorry. What I did was just rotate the tool tip. These are called teardrop scrapers. Used to be able to buy them. I now have to have them manufactured for me, cut for me. They're really handy shape tool. Uh, so I rotated it so I can again cut with the long straighter edge. And the closer I get to that final surface, the more I want to be using that straighter kind of edge. And the shavings I get with these are really remarkable. There's actually the shavings that are in these plastic balls. Uh, when people buy a lamp from me, they get a plastic ball with the shavings in them. Uh, well, I'll show them to you in a second. Yeah, let's do the light again.
So these shavings are, I don't know how thick they are, they're nothing. And the grain lines are going across them. So they're not like a hand plane sh uh, shaving. These have no strength. You just tug on them. You look at them sideways and they fall apart. But when I demonstrate, especially for people who aren't wood turners and they see these, they love them. And then I had one woman who picked up a handful of them, shoved them in her pocket to show her husband when she got home. <laughs> she just had crumbs. <laughs> Um, but I love these shavings. When I demonstrate outside, I used to demonstrate for a week every summer at the Balsams Hotel and when it was open. And uh, there you can see some nice ones there. A bundle of them. Try to hide and there's a little breeze. They start flying around in the air like dandelion fluff. And they can actually almost be blinding if a breeze suddenly comes back towards me. <laughs> it's very hard to do this outside because the light. So, you know, I don't have the ability to control. I don't have David there to turn the lights on and off. Okay, let's. I guess I can do this. Yeah. So this shade is from a freshly cut log. All those logs that are stacked up on end right outside my shop door are all from one tree. So I cut the tree down, and I'm making her a bunch of lampshades from that, from that tree. So it's a very yellow color uh, to, the, to the translucent wood. Now when I'm, you know, I'm using my fingers on the outside to try to dampen vibration and the friction is making it hot. So I'm just spraying water on it to act as a coolant lubricant. Some of these have little halogen lights on them. I want something that's broad across the surface. In fact, when I'm doing further in there, I might pull this back even further to get a broader, even lighting on that surface. So now, the last thing I'm doing here, I, I think I've got the thinness the way I want it for most of it. But if you can see it's redder, the last inch of thinness is a little redder, and that's because it's a little thicker. So that's what I'm going to do now is that last little section. In fact, I can, I can feel it on the inside a little bit, a little bit of a ridge as it gets thicker. So I'm going to try to join what I did with the gouge one direction and what I'm doing with this tool the other direction. It's actually the hardest spot on the whole shade is to join those two directions. I call it the inner equator of a sphere. It's like the widest point on the inside. Those two directions come together, and it's, sometimes I get a tiny little ridge there, but I can't use either tool too far overlapping because I'll get a little tear out from that. The whole, the whole section I'm doing is about three inches. I usually work in three or four inch sections at a time uh, because I, again, it's just why do I use this big mass, leave this big mass of wood here. If I tried to thin the whole thing at once, you can already see flexibility here. Can you see that from where you are? Um, if I try to do the whole thing at once, I'll start to get harmonic vibration setting up and you know right away when you get those, it's a that's an impossible problem. You can't have chatter, chatter, you know. You ever use chatter work tools? 
Chatterwork tools work on the principle of the tooltip vibrating, whereas the kind of chatter that most of us are trying really hard to avoid is based on the wood vibrating. That's pretty good. So I'll get the double-ended calipers again. I saw David go out. Oh, we got an assistant light guy now. <laughs> I thought. Outside. about that. There are, each section of it is different in terms of its orientation to the grain. The light will go through the end grain a lot more easily than the side grain. So this, when I do make shades, I make some shades that are, they start curved in and then do that. So a section of it is in exactly side grain. It has to be thinner there than a section that's more oriented around the end grain. So that's why I don't really get hung up on the calipers because they, if I was trying to, if I tried to make this all like that same thickness, it would be different light values. When I'm doing, uh, where is it? There it is. When I'm doing uh, match sets, it is important that they're the same thinness. And what I'll do is the first one, I'll measure up near the rim here, and this is a wooden taper gauge. Does that make sense? It's like a long, and I've marked it with uh, millimeters, and I slide it in there. So that's, that's actually pretty typical for the ones I make, about nine millimeters. I actually don't know if it really is nine millimeters. It just happens to be the way I mark this as nine millimeters. <laughs> is nine millimeters similar to a tenth of an inch? Way more? Okay, so forget, it's just nine. Nine something. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, this is my system, patented system. <laughs> um, so that's really important when I'm doing a match set because you can't have one shade that's red and one that's yellow. So if you have three, you could have a redder one in the middle or a larger one, but if they're really supposed to be matched, that's the one time I use these calipers. So what I would normally do at this point is go back to the outside, continue this another maybe three inches on the outside, come back and do another three inches, maybe four inches on the inside. And then eventually, uh, it'd be good if I had, I don't have an example of that here. Uh, if this was a regular table lamp shade uh, or floor lamp shade, at the very narrow end, so the, Shades coming up like this. At the top uh, rim, inside the top rim, there's a kind of a step I create. I usually have a table lamp shade out here, and I don't. I do so much installation work now, I don't. Uh, no, it doesn't have it, but I guess I could sort of try to show you what I mean. So right up in here, there'd be a little step in there, and that's where the shade ring is going to sit inside that step. Well, it doesn't grab it. I purposely make the, the, the step or the ring, or the, in, the ring on the shade about an eighth of an inch to a little more than an eighth of an inch bigger than the shade ring that's gonna go in there. It's actually the other way around. I make the step and then I make a shade ring that's a little bit smaller that, that'll fit in there. I then adhere that in there with clear silicone that allows the wood to continue to expand and contract. If you put the shade ring in tight, and then you get a dry day in the middle of winter with wood heat, which we have wood heat in our house, it would clamp on there and it would cause a crack 
here because the wood would have to give. Uh, the clear silicone stays soft forever and it's been a great system. Uh, so then further steps. So before I cut it off from the lathe, I would sand it, but I can't sand it right now. It's too wet. The surface, I can feel it right away. When you touch this, it's got a moist feel. So there's two things I do. One is to just leave it for an hour to three hours, depending on the outdoor humidity. Uh, so a day like today, it would take longer. If it's really blue sky in the winter, it would take shorter. I'm trying to get to the point where the surface is dry, but the, it's not much wood, but the inside of that wood, I'm still hoping, is moist. And then I can sand it and get nice dust uh, from sanding. If I tr tried to put sandpaper on it right now, it just glazes over the sandpaper. Uh, the other way that I can dry them, and sometimes the, they dry in a kind of patchy way, so some parts of it will stay wetter and some parts will be drier. So you can see it there. Oh, well, you won't be able to see this very well. But there's moisture on my hand. And this one's, because I'm because I'm demonstrating it's going a lot slower than I normally would. Um, so if there's a wet area, I can force the air out of just that wetter area. And on, you know, if there's a drier area, I might actually squirt that area and dry that area. So this goes back to a question that came from tell. These stay round, except for microscopically not round, but it's not like a salad bowl with a salad where they shrink across the grain and stay the same dimension on the length of the grain. These are symmetrical to the annual ring, so they shrink quite a bit, actually. A shade this size will shrink half an inch to sometimes even three quarters of an inch in diameter, but it'll stay around because it's concentric to the annual rings. Uh, and they, so the, the proviso to that is that microscopically they will go out around. Microscopically meaning just like less than a hundredth of an inch, but a tenth of an inch shade, if it shifts, say this isn't exactly a round log to start with, then it will go slightly out around. Or if there's places that are wetter and drier, the drier parts have started to shrink and the wetter parts are still higher, bigger, then when I'm sanding it, I'm more sanding those high points as it comes around, and I'll start to get some variation in the translucency, because I've changed. it might be a hundredth of an inch over a tenth of an inch on one part, and a hundredth of an inch under. Well, that's enough to be a shift in the color. So I'm really trying to sand these at just the right moment. And uh, if I, so what'll happen in this particular case, because I'm not gonna finish it today, I'm gonna, get it quite wet with the sprayer and put a bag around it. I, normal, I would love to be able to come back to it tomorrow, but I'm, I've got to go visit a client tomorrow, so I'm not gonna get to this till Monday. I'm hoping it stays round enough. It prob probably will because it's a, not a spalted age log. Um, Well, these, the ones that are spalted already already have the funguses in the wood, so when you bag it up, you'll get some more funguses and molds in there. Uh, my preference is to not wait at all. I normally would do this. As soon as I get to the point of starting to thin it, I would work straight through the whole rest of the shade uh, in one day. So I'm usually starting early and making sure that you know, I don't have things happening in the middle of the day that are going to interrupt it. When I demonstrate, I don't have that, that, that option, so I have to hope that things will stay around enough. And they usually do if I get them wet enough right now and bag it up. It's a little tricky with a... So the, the ones that from a freshly cut log I call the, the clear look. It's more that yellow look without the streaks in it. And if I bag this, that's the one thing that could happen between now and Monday. I might get some really subtle very early spalting, which might look good or might not, depends. Um, what I may do is tomorrow just come out here and try to blast the water out of it and then apply new fresh water. There's things I could do by adding a little bit of bleach or something, but I don't. Yes. 
So the normal course of things would be I would get the whole shape, get the inside thinned down, the little step there, but I'd leave it attached and get it to the point where I can sand it. And I sand the outside just with... Uh, That's 220, so see it glaze up. <laughs> uh, I would start with 150, 220, 400 using this um, cloth paper. Then I'd switch to paper and do 400 and 600. Um, maybe this is obvious to everyone, but cloth, cloth 220 is coarser than paper 220 because the cloth has a texture to it, and it's pushing some of those sharp little points of grit up higher, and it's much more likely to leave those obnoxious sanding marks. So I do, uh, I overlap the paper system. On the inside, oh, so when I'm doing the outside, uh, the cloth is, more durable and easier to blast. If it does glaze up at all, I can use the air compressor and kind of clean it out and keep using it. Um, I, I find for coarser work, the cloth just works better. Um, maybe that's just habit on my part. Uh, when I'm doing the outside sanding, I have an old sanding sponge. I'm not using it as a sander. I'm just using it as something to hold on the inside. So. I would normally have the sanding cloth here and hold it like this. Because when it's thin, it's flexible. On the inside, for years, I use a, get this out of the way. For years, I did the inside with an air compressor in my, so the inside's a problem because the sanding dust is sort of stuck, gets stuck on the inside. And just gets between the sandpaper and the wood. So I had a way of sort of holding this and sandpaper in my hand at the same time. I did it for years, but it, it actually gave me issues with my wrist because it was really contorted. So then I switched to a couple things that made this better. One is this is the one-way bowl steady, I think it's called. So I get that on the outside. I thought about using the, one of these things for years, and I always thought it might be a problem. If a vibration set up, it might make it worse. It like started rattling. Um, did I just do something? It seemed like the sound changed. Um, turned out not. One-way gave me one of these because I demonstrate. I love it. So that's a big difference on the outside of steadying it. And then I got one of these gadgets. This is called uh, Flexos. Is that what it's called? Uh, Xair is the name of the company. So these are hoses that have like a bendable thing inside them. So I mount that and this. So I'm sanding on the inside, blowing the sawdust out and holding this. So now I only have to hold one thing rather than I was doing three things with two hands, which never works very well. Uh, so that's just another little gadget that's really helped me a lot. Let's see. Oh, so once I got it sanded, um, then I would remove it from the lathe. And the way I do that is I hollow further in that direction. So there's like the shade and the hub, the sort of a remaining piece of wood. I'm hollowing into that hub or whatever you want to call the big chunk. And it ends up being like a thin pipe that's holding it on, just like a, a thin ring of wood holding it to this substantial piece here. And that gets, I use light again here to see the thinness of that. I call it the pipe, I don't know, the, the ring of wood. And I get it to the point where it's like this thickness, and then I use a Japanese, with a lathe off, 
I can use a Japanese saw to get a thin cut and cut through there. So the really big shade that's over uh, just to the left of the one that's lit up, that one I worked on on Wednesday. And if you look at the, the small rim of it, you'll feel the kind of the rem uh, remains of the day of, of what that cut was about there. Um, the cutting it off. Yes, I get it thin, of course, with the lathe on, but now, I did all that without looking at my notes, which probably means there were a bunch of things that I was supposed to tell you. Um, so I'm going to try to glance at my notes while you ask other questions, if you have other questions. No? Piercing? Piercing or burning? Yeah. Oh, you mean the, the laser down like this, the, the, uh, the hollow cutting system that uses the laser indicator? Yeah. Um, well, I'm not familiar with that. There is a system uh, where you have a, I think there's a light that goes, I used to know how it worked, but now I don't. Yeah. Right. Right. That's, that's, that's right. If you get hung up on the uh, measuring thickness, I think you just get in trouble. You end up with different uh, illumination, illumination values, and it just interferes with the whole process. It's much better to just do it with your eyes, and you get a much better result, and you're not hung up on the technology. So that's... Uh, Another question people ask me a lot is, do I, would I ever use a McNaughton type system and get several shades out of one of these? I'm actually, this is kind of snooty of me, but I'm not a fan of the McNaughton systems. I can always tell when people are using McNaughton systems. Their bowls all are the same shape. They're all parts of the sphere, and they do what they can to make them look like less than a truncated sphere, but truncated, oh, I've got... Mike here is a geometry guy. You've got to be careful. That's probably the wrong word. Uh, part of a sphere. <laughs> but, you know, the, the McNaughton system is based on creating spheres, portions of a sphere. Uh, also, the McNaughton system is based on side grain, turn, side grain wood so that you can snap out the piece and the cutter is working the direction that you would normally work on the inside of a pole. So... I don't think it would work nearly as well going into wet wood this direction. But it would also lead, all my shades would start to look like the same shape and they'd all be shallow uh, hemispheres. Uh, so I, and I'm not working with wood that's expensive. Loggers love me. I, you know, I, I pay them really well for these logs, but it still doesn't amount to very much compared to the cost of my shades. I, so I'd much rather not have anything dictating to me, even in subtle ways, about the shape. I want these tall shapes that are real lampshade shapes, and I want them to be like a bell shape or all these shapes that you wouldn't get with a McNaughton system. So, and a McNaughton, those bowl, nested bowl systems are cool. If I was doing a lot with Coca Bolo or something like that, I'd be pretty so expensive. But I just am not a fan of how the bowls are so influenced by the technology. Okay, that so that's the tulip poplar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and you can get purples. Right, because they're not related species. They're just the same word used to apply to two different species. If you go to the mid-Atlantic states, there's some in Connecticut. I guess someone said there's some in southern New Hampshire even, but I think they're planted. No, they're tulip poplar or yellow poplar, they call it sometimes. They come, they're much bigger trees. They have, in the spring, they have big, droopy yellow flowers on them. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, for some things, those colors are nice. Most people don't really like the green color, especially. Um, this typically doesn't get a green color. Uh, Sometimes there's some reds that form during the uh, pinks and reds that form during spalting, but typically it's pretty yellow. Interestingly, it has, as a growing tree, it has the highest moisture content of any tree in North America. And it's probably a connect, so Bruce Hoadley, do you, do you know who Bruce Hoadley? Bruce Hoadley was probably the premier wood technology guy in the world. He was a professor at U, uh, UMass. And he passed away a few years ago. Uh, he demonstrated for the guild several times, and I got to know him through that. And he was fascinated with what I'm doing. He said, no one's ever done any research on translucency in wood. He and I both just speculated that the fact that this has such a high moisture content as a growing tree, that unique property must be related to this other unique property of translucency. I burn a lot of it. We use it for our fall and spring wood. And I only use it because I have logs that have gotten too aged or have knots in them or whatever. But I burn about a quart of that a year and two quarts of hard hardwood, real hard hardwood. Uh, and it's actually, it's easy to carry around when it's dry. It's lighter and it's good when you don't need a big hot fire. But certainly in the middle of winter, it would be an uphill climb. Yeah. Um, it has the, some of the spalted stuff has a really interesting smell when I'm working on it. Um, there's, there's, yeah. Um, whether you like the smell or not is some people say it smells a little barnyard like. Right. Yeah. Well, the Excelsior is sort of like that. Um, also, the shaker, shakers used to make Christmas tree ornaments out of it, and people still do now make Christmas tree ornaments out of aspen. I don't really know why they chose it, except it's so lightweight. They're the kind of woven strips, uh, making like angel shapes. Oh, when I'm sanding, I definitely, I have a dust collector and I a dust mask. Uh, because, the, because the dust is so wet, even when it's sort of dry, it's wet, it kind of settles. It's not like dry, like maho I use mahogany sometimes. That makes a dust that sort of fills the air. This doesn't really, it's easy to collect, easy to avoid. I haven't had any, and I'm fortunate, I've never had any problems with spalted wood. I've used spalted wood for so long, and some people have bad reactions to spalted wood, but, or, or else I do have bad reactions to it, and I'm just so bad I'm not aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're guides. So when I'm making oops, uh, the pair that's just to the left of that floor lamp base there was done with this guide. Uh, and I cut them so I can do, whoops, this way. I can do a section and then I can tape on the next part of the little jig. Um, and it's remarkable how similar I can get them. Yeah, I have to, I have to, I used to put strips of wood here and screw on the parts and I realize it's a lot easier to just use painter's tape. So, and some of them are adjustable. Um, this shape shade is one that I do a fair amount of this sort of, I call it the simple mushroom cap shade. Of course it would be that, a <laughs> mushroom cap would be that way. And I can change the angle of this by rotating that part, whereas the first one I showed you is sort of a fixed shape. Um, the which part? Oh, I didn't do a curved tool rest either. Uh, so. Oh. Uh, um, could you grab, there's a shade ring on the top of that middle table lamp there, just the wooden, yeah, that, grab that. You can toss it to me like a Frisbee probably. So that's a typical shade ring. 
Um, you can't just use the metal one. You know, they make pre-made metal ones with wires, but I'm making these to fit the hole that I've created. You can't predict well enough how much shrinkage they'll be. So I make, I, I make tons of these. I have stacks of them over there in the corner, all increments of an eighth of an inch. And I can usually just find one in my stack that will fit in there. Um, and if I need to, if it didn't dry exactly round, I can just sand off a little bit of the edge to make, make it fit. Uh, no, the hanging ones are like the one that's hanging and lit over there is actually for a hanging one. They have a, a ball chain web that holds it up on a ring on a, con a conical socket. And the chains allow it to expand and contract. The wide rim is where it'll move the most. Get that away from it. That's not good. Got warm over there. Um, so it's really important that everything about how these are held up eventually allows movement. So the, uh, the sconces are half shades. They're attached to a kind of wood hub at the bottom. But again, there's some allowance for movement there. I'm not the rim of, so this isn't really a whole half shade, but if it was a half shade where this mounts to the wall, it's not held it's held entirely by a hub here. So this can continue to expand and contract. Um, you just can't do anything to lock it into place. Oh, finish, that's good. Um, I use a finish, I found this finish 35 years ago. It's pretty much the only finish I've used my entire career as a woodworker. It's, it's made by, it's been, so the formula has been sold a couple of times, but it's a company in Pennsylvania, New Jersey now, that makes, they only sell it in five gallon cans. They describe it often as a urethane oil, but they provide one of those, you know, 10 page product data safety sheets and a chemist looked at it for me and said, there's no urethane in this. So, but it's in that category. It's a synthetic, I call it a synthetic tongue oil. I put it on as if it was tongue oil. I, it looks like tongue oil, but it's permanent. It polymerizes a hundred percent. So it's not like any of the natural, oh, uh, who brought the two cherry bowls? Uh, yeah. So your bowl that was with a flatter finish, that's pretty typical of what happens with the natural oil finishes, is that they get flatter and flatter over time. This is a, it stays the same. I have lampshades in the house that are pretty much the first ones I made, and they look the same as they did when I first put the finish on. So I do have bottles of it over there if anybody's interested. A lot of wood turners in the guild use, use it. Unfortunately, you can only get it in five gallon cans. Uh, Vanna, very nice. <laughs> um, you never have to renew it, so which is really important for a lampshade. First of all, they have warm bulbs in them, which would accelerate that degradation of the finish. And often they're in places where you can't put a finish on them again. And I don't want my clients to be bogged down with worrying about refinishing them. So it's permanent finish. Most things I've used it on everything I've made in my career. Uh, those cabinets have it on. The cabinets are 25 years old. I've never redone them. Um, it's, a, it's not a high gloss finish. Um, and I don't want gloss. You don't want a glossy finish on something like this because you don't want it to reflect all the other lighting around it. It'd be like glare on the windshield of a car where you can't see into the car. So I want something that's relatively flat. Of course, if you put enough coats of this on, you can get a gloss. Uh, but I just particularly like that it's permanent. Um, No, I don't put it on the, it, it's off the lathe at that point. Oh, so there's some other steps I didn't tell you about. So I get it off of the lathe. I've sanded it on the lathe, get it off the lathe, and it's like that big one that's over there on the table. In a day or two, it's 100% dried out. It's not like you have to wait, you know, like when you do twice turn bowl turning and you have to wait six months or a year or whatever. This is so thin and there's so much end grain involved. They dry very quickly. I usually put a blanket over them for the first day exposed to the air. Then, no matter how smooth I got it on the lathe, I have to do a fair amount more sanding because they get fuzzy, that the grain raises. Uh, so I, and I have to sand that rough kind of rim where I cut it off from the lathe. 
So this is an hour or two of, of hand sanding and a little bit of orbital sanding to get them ready to put the coat of finish on. And I put three coats on with sanding between coats, 600 grit between coats. Um, this is the only thing that I ever put three coats on. Everything else I ever made, I just put two coats on. It's just, this is so absorbent, just like it had so much water in it. When the water comes out, it wants to suck up a lot of finish. I put the finish on the outside really heavily and watch it come through the surface. So I'm really getting it, making sure it's completely impregnated. Um, three coats of finish and then I have to make sure that that finish is completely, oh, if you do use that finish, you should wait three days between uh, coats of finish. It'll seem dry like in an hour, but to polymerize it has to take more time. If you use it slowly, that, that can be a problem, um, but I use it pretty quickly. Um, what, for people who are using it slowly, what I recommend is finding somebody with a little kid, baby, and get those little glass baby food jars. They still make baby food in jar, glass jars, don't they? And just break it up into very small amounts, or find little condiment jars or something and break it up. Because yes, if you open and close it a lot, you will, it can gel. and You'll notice the smell changes. I think this is true of tongue oil, actually, too. If you notice the smell has changed on your finish, then you've got a problem. It's started to polymerize even as a liquid. So you really should pay attention to the good smell when you bought it new and keep, it, keep that smell. You can try to reconstitute it a little bit with some more paint thinner, but um, it's really not the same because it's already started that polymerization process. Uh, oh, well, lamp bases. I didn't talk about lamp bases. You can see some that I worked on yesterday. Um, for years, I made almost all my lamp bases out of mahogany, like the floor lamp base. I now use African mahogany rather than South American mahogany because it's not endangered. But I do a lot with unusual woods. Most of the pieces that are up on that shelf up there are camp for burl. It comes from the South Pacific. Amazing burl wood that does not tend to crack when it dries because it has so much of the camp oil in it. Um, beautiful wood. So I do a, a lot of different things with different kinds of wood. I do now a lot with these huge banksia seed pods. Um, there's a couple of fairly big ones there. Um, you almost can't find pods like that in this country. I've got someone in Australia who finds these super big ones. Uh, those are very popular for me, the pod bases. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, it's hard to see. Uh, behind that uh, rolling table on the floor, there's an extension bed for the one way. And down there is the leg for it. So that extends it out where I can do, I do floor torsier bases that are close to seven feet tall. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, Uh, it depends. That shape, I, I used a steady rest because it's so thin in that, that one part. Generally, I'm not using steady rest, but I, I do. Sometimes I'll use this one. Yeah. Um, there was something else. That I, oh, Peter, you asked me something. Uh, you, tool rest. That's right. So I just used the straight tool rest for doing this first section of thinning. But... That doesn't, I could probably do one more short section with a straight tool rest, but then I switched to using these curved tool rests. This one is a cool tool rest, but the guy does it a long time ago. A guy, DJ, yeah, that's right. I used to have a DJ lathe that I used for demonstrating because I could move it around. Uh, you have it? Oh, I didn't know that. I thought uh, you and Sherry had it. That's right, he's Potter now, right? So do you, did Kevin ever make you a uh, tailstock for it? Oh yeah, two D, <laughs> wow. Those, they're cool lays. they're... The, the precision issues are a little off, but they they had a lot of it. That's the first lampshades I made were on 
not the DJ you have. It was more like the one. Well, the, it's more like the one you got from Meta Premiums Estate. Yeah. Um, yeah. It didn't come with a. The you end up with a curved tool rest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Huh. And so I, when I wanted a bigger one, uh, one way had just gotten a new metal bender machine for making, they do sell curved tool rests that are smaller than this. So they offered to try to make a bigger one for me. And I do use this on the big lathes. It, it's not as stable as it should be out here. I, and I don't know, I'd, it'd be cool to have something like this, maybe with round stock. The round stock seems to help or maybe it's just because it's shorter. This one's much more stable than this one. Um, it's thicker and, but this is very thick in the dimension you would think would matter. Yeah. So, uh, but I make do. Um, I'm sure there's some notes. Well, there's a note here about how do I feel about imitators. When my father was alive, he used to, it used to bother him to no end that I would go around and demonstrate and show people how I did this. And they're like, you gotta protect this. You're the only guy in the world who does this. Why are you showing other people how to do it? Well, now, 25, 26 years later, there's still nobody who's copied me. So I've stopped. I never really worried about it a whole lot. But, um, but I do feel kind of paternal about this idea of it. And so when people do make lampshades based on seeing the lamp, uh, my demonstrations, I, I just ask them to send me photos and tell me about their experience of it. Uh, so if any of you do that, I would love to see what you come up with. Um, well, so an interesting, this is a little bit more philosophical. So 1800 plus lampshades, it, have I ever gotten bored doing this? Uh, and I think it's part of my personality. I've always, like, I do photography. I like really going back to the same place again and again and going deeper and deeper into that, what, it, what it's about. And I love it. I love the work aspect of it. I like the, the working with a chainsaw, whole logs being, and, and the precision. It's like that whole mix of every kind of part of it. I love that it's unusual and I love that it's functional. I love the relationship I have with my clients who well over something between 60 and 70% of the lamps I sell now are to people who own my lamps already. So I have this continuing relationship with those people and it, it's very gratifying to me knowing that they're expensive and that they want to keep adding to their collection of lamps. Um, and it tells me that, well, first of all, it tells me that they're durable. <laughs> They wouldn't come back to me if it wasn't for that, but that it has that much meaning to them. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, but I just like, you know, I keep coming up with new things to do with it. Working with my blacksmith, I started doing that 10 years ago. We've done over 50 projects now. And, you know, that there's always something new. The new I do all the design work on these projects with the blacksmith, but, uh, and I like that part too. I don't know how long I can keep doing it though. Just went on Medicare what's the, eight days ago, <laughs> which is a great relief in terms of finances. Uh, but this is physical, and it's something that at some point there's a limit to how much I can keep doing it, or I'll just start making 10-inch diameter sconces or something. Well, that's a funny detail. If you, if you do decide to try this out, don't make something really small it's actually harder to make a 10 inch diameter shade than it is like a 13 inch diameter shade. When you get really small here, it's much harder to do the work on the inside. It's much harder to see that inner surface to make sure the translucency is even. And it's just so constrained in those small spaces. It's much easier to have a little more room to work with. As long as your lathe is up to the task. Um, you know, having a one way definitely helps. Go to Dick's house. Make it on Dick's lathe. Oh, no, because last time I bought them, I, had, I bought a bunch of them, and I don't want to ever have to buy them again. Except I do have, when they get down to really a little smaller than this, then I stop using them. And I have a whole box full of these. Um, 
So if anybody wants one just to try out a little one, um, I'd be glad to give it. Oh, I didn't talk about the metal involved. Uh, my, my turning gouges are all made with powdered, is that, tell me if I'm right, John, powdered metallurgy. Uh, much, they hold an edge much longer than uh, regular high-speed steel. A funny thing about Aspen is it must have a lot of silica in it because it, it, it'll dull your tools faster than most other woods. It's relatively soft, but it really does a number on, maybe it's acidic in the sap. Something will eat away at the fine edge. So I want a long lasting edge. Uh, and these cutters are all made out of an unusual steel called Tantung, which I think is also powdered metallurgy. Uh, pretty expensive stuff and it's hard to get it cut and ground, but uh, high speed steel will work, but you, Tantung is really cool stuff. Yeah, I have my, my grinder is set always the same angle as this, so the sharpening process is really easy. Because I never let things get very dull, so it's not like I'm, and you know, I can feel a nice edge on that. And I, I have a nice collection of them so that I don't have to sharpen each time. I, want, I can just grab one out of the set here and have a sharp one. And the, uh, the spear point ones are double-ended. Um, okay, I'm kind of running out of things. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's interesting. I, uh, when I was in college, I went to Hampshire College. I was part of the first graduating class at Hampshire College. And I was interested in education, and I led a group of people who went to a, a wooden, an educational wooden toy factory near Boston. And uh, I, I remember this so clearly. They had these beautiful pieces of birch, I think it was uh, birch plywood, cut into squares. And they were going to drill holes in them and thread them and make those kind of nut and bolt type of things. And I picked up two of them and tapped them together. and the, the sound they made and the way they almost stuck to each other because of the, the, I just was so attracted to that. I can't explain it. That one moment, I was living up here, going to Massachusetts. The next year I was in Boston in grad school and I was driving up and down the highway in, Wo uh, in Woburn. It used to be the Woodcraft store in Woburn. It's not there anymore. I just was there recently. Yeah, uh, That was the original Woodcraft store, their only store. And I went in there on a whim and bought a gouge and a mallet, and I had a chain, so I lived way out in the woods. So I started making sculptures. Uh, and I did that for several years, and then when I decided I wanted to do it for a living, I had no training as an artist. So making sculptures, you're kind of in the art world. It's like people talking wine talk. I didn't have any interest in talking about high flute and art stuff. So then I changed everything to make things functional. So, no, no, I started with uh, pencil cups and hand mirrors and jewelry boxes, always sculptural. I was interested in sculptural shapes. Um, I have had, I've done a little bit, but I don't do much in the way of joinery. I've never had much interest in, in taking lots of small pieces of wood and assembling something big. I'm much more interested in big pieces of wood and taking away subtractive woodworking. I did a lot of bandsaw boxes. Yeah, if you, if you do go into my showroom, you'll see a bookcase and there's some shelves and there's sort of my museum of old, old, some older things that I've made. There's a couple of bandsaw boxes. But I'm, I, there's still a few bottle stoppers in my showroom, even though I stopped making them. Uh, I used to, as when I was demonstrating, I'd often would just quickly do a bottle stopper as part of the demonstration, just so people could see something manageable. That's why I have the mini lathe right there is for bottle stoppers. Um, oh, I used to make so many things, but hand mirrors, the, the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen used to have a, a fellow who made hand mirrors for all the shops, and then he moved to Colorado, and Gordon Keeler said, Peter, you got to make hand mirrors, they all need hand mirrors, and that was sort of my, my way in. But for a while, I made everything, you name it, cutting boards, uh, pencil, I made a million pencil cups. Uh, I kept raising the price on the pencil cups to try to sell fewer, 
every time I raised the price, I sold more. It was crazy. Uh, um, there's actually some pencil cup, kind of crude versions of my pencil cups around here. Clocks, I made a million different shapes. Mantle clocks and wall clocks. Uh, Well, that's a pair of sconces, so that so I've cut that in half because a client wanted to see a small pair of sconces, and I didn't have one to show them. Um, it was already going to be sconces; I just hadn't gotten around to cutting it. And I just made the hub for it yesterday, but the hub hasn't been cut in half. Yeah, I use silicone. That allows a little bit of creep if it needs to move. They're pretty small diameter there, so they don't tend to move much, but they do actually sort of expand around or shrink up around the hub. Thank you. You were very patient.